Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Welcome to Sports Spectrum. I am Jason Romano. Today's guest on the podcast is Melanie Newman, a bit of a broadcasting pioneer. Melanie is the Salem Red Sox lead broadcaster. That is the Boston Red Sox high A minor league affiliate. And she is the play-by-play broadcaster, and we'll explain the significance of that in just a moment. But before we get to Melanie and our interview, our conversation with her, I want to tell you about Compassion International, the most trusted child development ministry in the world. Here is an opportunity for you to make a lasting impact by investing in bringing Compassion's proven programs to children in poverty helping to respond to these urgent needs of these children living in poverty. You can make that difference by going to Compassion.com. That's the website, Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Your tax-deductible $38 a month gift can provide hope to a child in need. These children that are in poverty living day-to-day, They are without the basic essentials that every child deserves. Safe water, education, medical care, even safe housing that's substandard or in many cases non-existent. That's what's happening here when you make that leap, when you take that leap of faith and sponsor a child through compassion. Make a difference in a child's life. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Pray about it. Consider it and sponsor a child today. Really excited to bring Melanie Newman to the podcast today. Melanie, like I mentioned earlier, is the lead play-by-play broadcaster for the Salem Red Sox. That is the Boston Red Sox high A minor league affiliate. Melanie is sort of a jack of all trades. She's also a sideline reporter covering Liberty University football games for ESPN+. Plus. She'll also be doing the play-by-play for Liberty Home Volleyball matches on ESPN+. Plus. She's one of only five women in the nation to call play-by-play for a professional affiliated baseball team. And this past year, Melanie and her colleague Susie Cool, and Susie has the greatest last name ever, Susie Cool, they did 20 to 30 road games together and became the first two women ever for the first time to broadcast a minor league or major league baseball game. Lots of cool stuff here with Melanie Newman. She's a bit of a pioneer in the broadcasting industry, just 28 years old, and uh, has a great future ahead of her. I think you'll love getting to know my new friend, Melanie Newman, from the Salem Red Sox and from ESPN Plus here on Sports Spectrum's podcast. Take a listen. Melanie, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's a long time coming. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to talking to you. Glad we were able to connect. And I remember, I think it was on Twitter where, you know, because so much is posted, especially in this sort of small world that is the broadcasting world where it seems like everybody knows everybody on some level or another. Um, two things pop up. So first is you being one of just five women in the nation to call play-by-play for a professional affiliated baseball team, which is awesome. And I'll get into that in a second. But the other one was a little more recent, August 31st, and that's opening day of college football. And you're assigned to Liberty Football's broadcast. I believe they were playing Syracuse. And Coach Hugh Freeze, who's been on this podcast three times actually now, um, was adamant about coaching that game. And somehow he did it from a bed that was brought into the press box area, a coaching box area, which is crazy. But all of a sudden you're thrusted in in the midst of this into the national spotlight a little bit for an interview you did with coach freeze. Tell us, tell us what happened with that. I never expected for it to have the traction that it did. I, I don't know because being a part of Liberty, I've done work on and off with them for the last five years. So mm-hmm. I've always felt very comfortable uh, with the flames family and getting to meet coach freeze and his wife, Jill and his daughters, they were all just so welcoming and, yeah. yeah. And I told people before, you know, if you shut your eyes and just listen to him talk that day, you wouldn't think, oh, OK, he's in a hospital bed because he just he sounded like a normal 
coach would on a game day situation. So we just had a what I perceived as a normal conversation. And I think sometimes you get in that little rabbit hole of, you know, you know that in sports you're going to do weird stuff sometimes and certainly doing things like track and field. I've done interviews with athletes while we sat on the ground so they could catch their breath. So, okay, guys, yeah. in a hospital bed, it's different. But uh, I didn't pick up on the fact that the rest of the nation would, you know, <laughs> see this and, and catch fire with it and talk about it. Um, but he was so gracious and calm about everything and it, it made it really easy. And to have him on the sidelines this past weekend, he was just so excited, but, uh, it was definitely a, a, just another one of those crazy hallmark moments of this entire year, honestly. Yeah. You never forget those weird moments too. I wonder, cause I've had a lot of experiences in my uh, career, not really interviewing people, but more as a producer, but did you kind of realize in the moment that this was happening, that this could be something that a lot of people might be interested in, especially in the, the day and age you're in your late twenties in the day and age of social media, which you pretty much grew up with and knowing where we are, that all it takes is one interview that might be on even a local channel or ESPN plus is, is, has a big audience, but it's not their large giant television audience. Yeah. And, and yet it doesn't matter because social media will take this thing and run with it. I, I really didn't think anything about it um, <laughs> until it did go viral. And I started getting that, you know, you've been tagged in this. I was like, Oh no, what? <laughs> um, and I think part of that is because, he made it normal. Like coach didn't want it to be about himself at all. He wanted to be about the guys about like how big that game was. The fact that it was the first ACC opponent to come to Liberty. Um, so I think his normalization of it and his downplaying of his physical situation and, and turning the focus to, to keep everything on the actual team itself was why I had underestimated. I think the impact of that moment in that situation. Now, Melanie, you live in, this broadcasting world, you're in that grind mode, which I love watching people who are just hungry and want to learn and want to get more experiences. And so the next day, September 1st, you're calling a Salem Red Sox game, which was your <laughs> other job in which they clinch a, divi yep. a division title. So that kind of sounds like a little bit of a whirlwind in those couple of days going from football to baseball and the experiences that happen. What was that like? That seems like a pretty good couple of days. Well, so I'll sum up that week for you, actually. We started in Salem. I flew to Des Moines, Iowa for the Axe Throwing U.S. Open for ESPN and <laughs> okay. then flew in and joined the team on the road in Winston-Salem, found out that my only sister had her firstborn child with her husband, so I mm. became an aunt for the first time, got on the bus, went back with the team, was in Salem for 24 hours, went and did the Liberty game and Coach Freeze and the bed interview and all that, and then, yeah, and, and I, I remember standing on the sidelines that night because I've lived and died with every pitch for these boys for 137 games at this point. Yeah. And just praying that the other team we were trying to edge out would win their game so that they wouldn't clinch on the one night that I wasn't there. Um, and, and the other team ended up winning, so it held it off. And then I came home, and it's like you said, on Sunday, and it was just this picturesque day. And they, they clinched to take it. I got to have that that call that you wait for where you get to, you know, shout that they're going to the playoffs and, <laughs> uh, you know, going in the clubhouse and the champagne showers and just it was the most unbelievable week of my life. Uh, and I, I've been t telling several people that I don't think I'll ever have a week that prolific of just back to back to back life events and experiences and career moments, maybe ever. I mean, that that's tough to be. That's a pretty good week. I mean, that's one you'll <laughs> never forget. That'll be in the book of Melanie Newman someday when <laughs> when you write your uh, your pen, your autobiography. Now, that role with the Salem Red Sox we talked about, this is Salem, Virginia, right, that you're yes, in. Yes, yes, not Massachusetts. That's right. So Salem, Virginia. And that role was a big deal for you because you were calling play-by-play. -play. Um, one of only five women in the nation to call play-by-play -play for a professional affiliated baseball team, which was fascinating when I saw that. I was like, why isn't there more? So tell us yeah. about this season for you and what it was like. You said 120 plus, 130 plus games being around them. And I know that minor league lifestyle I, I through our ministry with Sports Spectrum, getting to interview tons of pro baseball players, but guys that are in the minors, single A, double A, it's not the most glamorous lifestyle. They're, they're, <laughs> they're really pushing through just to kind of grind through every day. And in many ways, you probably relate to that with your own role. Tell us what this season was like and being a part of 
being the voice in many ways of a baseball team like that? Uh, it's the most growth I've ever had, both personally and professionally. Uh, with every great moment, with the high of that clinch, uh, there was a lot of tears, a lot of late nights. Uh, I had four straight days before opening day that I did not go to bed. Mm. Um, it's kind. Of, I tell people that all the time. It's like being in college all over again because the <laughs> studying and the work just doesn't stop. You're almost in like finals mode, twenty four seven. Yeah. Um, in in a lot of ways, it was so much of a god thing because I actually found out the day that pitchers and catchers reported that I no longer had a job due to budget cuts. Mm. And you know, at that point, you're like everything in baseball has already been spoken for. There's nobody who's still looking to hire somebody in, in the twelfth hour of, you know, preseason and everything else. And just got very lucky that within 24 hours of me finding out, I didn't have a job that Salem reopened. They had already hired someone for the position and he flipped and left for a different team. Um, wow. so I jumped on it right away and e everything was just such a, a destiny type situation at that point that that there was never a doubt in my mind that this was where I was supposed to end up. Um, and with that late hiring, you know, it was kind of being thrown into the fire. I was down, in spring training. And luckily this year I had opted to work Florida spring training, which is the Boston's uh, home base. So I yeah. got the chance to kind of double dip. I'd get up about four o'clock in the morning and drive the two hours to Fort Myers to be at camp, to just start putting names and faces together and just kind of assimilating what the season could look like. And then driving back up to Tampa where I was stationed and working the actual spring training games for the rest of the day and then, you know, diving into a media guide and everything else that had to be done for Salem. And then I had 12 hours at home in Atlanta to pack up the remainder of my things that I hadn't taken to spring training and move to Virginia and, you know, see how it would go. And you know, I wasn't really sure of what responsibilities I would have outside of the obvious play calling duties. And we kind of found out together as a staff, which I was very appreciative that they were so gracious and understanding and supportive of like, yeah, you know, this wasn't the most ideal timing situation, but they were very open about how happy they were to have me. And then as we got into the season, everything just started to really click and really by the all-star break, um, the team and I had a good feel for each other and, and our relationship and the guys really knew that, where they could trust me and, and have those talks with about life when they wanted to and about the game and just really start to bring out that side of it. And that's what I love so much about minor league baseball is the statistics honestly come second because so many of them won't ever see the big leagues, but the fans will remember, you know, the guy that they can relate to who played in Australia for a year, the guy who came up with a single mother home in Compton, California, mm. those little pieces that, make you a human I, the shut up and play thing makes me insane because i don't think that's just to any athlete yeah uh, there's there's so much more sacrifice and struggle and emotion that they feel just like we do and i think if you don't bring that to the table you're you're really missing a huge mark and a chance to connect to the audience they say there's barriers right in in a lot of ways especially being a female in a in a male dominated sport like pro baseball and I thought it was cool to see you, and, and her name is Susie Cool, right? Is that her yeah. name? It's the greatest <laughs> yeah. name ever, Susie Cool. Melanie Newman's a cool name, too. But Susie Cool, when you have the name Cool in your name, that's pretty awesome. But you did 20 to 30 road, 20 to 30 road games this year together, and you became the first time, I believe this happened, that two women ever broadcast a minor league or major league baseball game. Correct. That's amazing to think about, and it's great as we look towards – progressing in the world that we live in today in 2019. Um, do you see yourselves as pioneers in a way? And, and, and were there any barriers that you kind of looked at and said, okay, I gotta, I gotta go through I know there's a lot of questions I'm asking, which is what you're not oh, you're supposed fine. to do in broadcasting, uh, when you're asking it in, in questions in an interview, but there's a lot there, I think. Tell us about what that experience was like and maybe just the idea of being a pioneer in some ways in accomplishing this this role with Susie cool. Yeah. So it was a similar situation with the freeze interview where my hiring was announced and I didn't really think anything of it. You know, I, I got another job. I, I've gotten several jobs, so this is great. Um, and then all of a sudden they released it while I was busy with ACC swimming and diving. So I, I'd set a time where I said, you know, we have a lunch break until this, Let's push the press release then just in case, you know, there's one or two emails or whatever. Yeah. My phone shut down three times oh. because it couldn't keep up with 
Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, email, I, I like everything just kept going off. And I'd never experienced a viral moment like that in my life. Um, and it was just wildfire. And the pioneering thing in black and white, I get it. And I, I see that and I've seen it already being printed up with Boston's historical guides and everything else. And it, it kind of takes you away for a moment that that's happening yeah. and that that's a, a cemented piece of history for the rest of your life. Because the reality of the situation for me is, OK, well, I'm showing up to do a job that I've been doing on a professional level since 2014, but on the reality since 2010. So it's just another normal day of doing what I've always been doing. But I think you do have to pay attention to the fact that that precedent was set and that that barrier was broken. The ceiling was lifted again and, and understand that there's now a new set of eyes and a new audience and a crowd that is going to be paying attention that hasn't previously. And that you do grow your chance to have a voice and to talk to people and to make an impact and to take advantage of the fact that you have that voice and to be a staunch supporter, not, not just in women. I, I, I've never wanted this to be a gender thing by any means, but to let people recognize that your job and what you want to do in life should never be defined by age, gender, race, uh, really any of it. Yeah. And, you know, if, that, if that's your passion, do your passion. That's good stuff. Melanie Newman's our guest here on Sports Spectrum. We like to tell the stories of sports and of faith. So let's learn your faith testimony. You grew up in Georgia, went to college at Troy University in Alabama. So you grew up in the South. Tell us about the role faith has played in your life growing up and maybe share your testimony with us. Yeah, as, as a kid, I, I think I was kind of that stereotypical, you know, your parents want to put you in a dress and tights and you're fidgeting and it's uncomfortable. And I was an introvert. So I didn't like the fact they were leaving me alone in Bible class every Sunday with all these kids I didn't know. And <laughs> you, you figure it out and you learn the stories, you have the kids Bible and it's great. But honestly, uh, for me, it was going into my first year at Kennesaw state. I, I forgave my senior year in high school um, and took college classes on campus. Instead, I, I really struggled with, with being bullied and, and some tough stuff. And, and high school just wasn't a place where I wanted to be anymore. Um, once I got to that college situation and I was kind of on my own when it came to going to church and having that accountability, that's where my faith spoke up. Mm. Um, and it's getting me surprisingly emotional right now. I just, I remember feeling so lost at one point and not being sure what to do. And I'm very grateful at the time that a good male friend of mine, his father was actually deeply involved with a ministry. Um, that was 10 minutes away from us. My, my house and Kennesaw state university are, are very close. So I, I lived at home for that year. Um, but so I went, it was a non-denominational church that was held in a high school auditorium because they, they didn't have a church yet. And just the relatability of the, the pastor and, and the messages that he would bring home and how he would make it a very real life sentiment and situation that I could actually grasp onto it. And it gave me, such a better focus and a drive and an understanding. And it, and it gave that compass back to me. Um, and from that point forward, there was really no question about it. I, I mean, and diving fully into keeping devotionals with me 24 seven, I, I love listening elevation churches, podcasts with Stephen Furtick. Yeah. Um, that's, that's my go-to when I'm driving now, just because I've found that that's the rock. And that's what's honestly enabled me to stay in this process of this career field without losing my mind <laughs> is just this very calming. Everything's going to be okay. And everything's already planned out, which is the hardest part about this is that faith and this industry specifically kind of mirror each other. in the fact that they're both blind. Yeah. Um, and, and I think having that and, and keeping that with me in my heart and practicing it daily and, and keeping my faith walk and talking to God and being surrounded also by people who share those values and who reinforce that, you know, hey, if you can keep this in your prayers and, and Rachel Barbo, she's been. <laughs> I love Rachel. She, yeah, yeah, she's she's so outspoken in her faith. And I think that's what really even further cemented it for me was to have someone like her, who's like a big sister who I look up to in so many ways, but she actively stokes that fire every day in me. And, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for it because if I didn't have my faith, I, I wouldn't be here right now. I really wouldn't. 
Yeah, Rachel is a, a great friend and uh, a great encourager for me, but she was on the podcast as well probably two years ago and just shared her story with such passion. She's yeah. awesome. She's awesome. If we have more Rachel Barbos in the world, we would be a, we'd be all pretty blessed, I would say. Um, I could not agree more. She's the best. Yeah. Melanie, let me ask you about that role of faith on a daily basis. You kind of pict- painted that picture a little bit, but I know in the in the world that you live in, the world that I've lived in, it's hard to keep that, to focus on keeping the main thing the main thing. Walk us through how you're able to do that. Uh, obviously, you're driving now, so you're able to pop in a podcast or pop in a sermon. But when you're in that midst of that 130-game grind in Salem, Virginia, and on the road in places like Iowa and other places, how are you keeping that faith stirred? Because it's hard, I think, as believers, you know, we're called to live our faith out. We're called to be in the word every day and talking with God. We're also called to be part of a body of believers and the church is important for, for the way that God set up his role in the kingdom. So how does all that play out for you on a daily basis, in season, out of season? What does that look like? I I think the first thing that, and this was something my grandmother had, had driven home was that your faith and your spirit are not defined by walking under a church roof. And and I know that you know this, but I mean, we have games every Sunday. And and so I'm in the office at 7 a.m. and I'm leaving maybe at eight o'clock at night and and we have to turn around for a Monday game or get on the bus and and go on the road. So I really only get to physically attend church when I'm home for the off season. Um, and, And that really kind of pushed back on me to challenge myself and to say, okay, so How do we keep this going? And I've noticed taking time for the little things. Like when I got on the road this morning, it was probably 530, 6 o'clock in the morning. And just the sky was unbelievable. And and just looking up and saying thank you. Or like hitting the light that you never get green and you finally get it green. (laughs) And just looking up and saying thank you. Um, So pausing and and taking those little moments every day. And just remembering to to say your thanks. And then the same thing again with surrounding yourself with people who share the faith. I I just had a phone call with a good friend of mine back home and we were talking about prayer and um, some stuff going on with her family. And so I think having that too and people who constantly, hey, can you can you pray about this or what can I pray for for you today? Even if it's just a text message, it reinforces that. But the biggest things that I practice Um, you know, outside of driving, I have headphones on all the time when I'm at work. And so usually what I'll do is, is I will start out with a podcast or, you know, there's a couple different faith channels on Spotify that I'll pull up and, uh, it just kind of, it gives you that uplifting, that calming presence, you know, when you've got those time constraints and you're on three hours of sleep, that just kind of, it gets you through it. But at night, regardless of what time I have, or if I'm sleeping on a bus, I have a journal with me and I actually started doing this four years ago, but All it is, is one line a day of what was good that day. And I call it a blessings book. Mm, Um, That's cool. And yeah. So basically you look back on your year and all you have is just a list of the good stuff. Um, So, you know, it can, it can rain and your car breaks down and everything else goes wrong, but your friend brought you a coffee into work. So if it's something, even if it's small, just finding that one good thing to write down. And then, and then even if I'm laying in bed and I'm half asleep, remembering, Hey, like, let's talk to God about today. Like what was good? What do we need forgiveness for? What are we looking for tomorrow? Who do we need to pray for? Um, and keeping a running prayer list on my phone, just anytime I see someone reach out, or even if it's just a general post out there that says, you know, Hey, uh, to the, to the Twitter verse, you know, I don't want to go into detail, but if you can pray for my family and just writing that down and remembering to, to keep those people, um, in, in your thoughts, it's just those really small practices that take maybe a grand total of five minutes out of my day, but it keeps, it keeps the fire going basically. Melanie, let me ask you this. I am not, I would never disclose ages of people on this podcast. I'm very (laughs) careful, but doing the math on when you graduated college, I'm guessing you're around 28. Is that Yep. Right. On okay. The nose. So you're 28 years old. So you're in your late 20s and you've grinded this broadcast journey out pursuing your dreams. Right. So let's talk to your 20 year old self or your 18 year old self from a few years in college, a few years back. And especially to the young ladies that are listening to this podcast, we have a lot of people who are in the broadcasting world, who are believers, who are athletes, who are believers, college students, who are athletes, who are believers that are listening to this podcast right now. Talk to them, talk to your 18 to 20 year old self and how to stay connected to God, 
but continue to striving for the dreams that you and the goals that you want to accomplish. It's okay to feel lost sometimes. Mm. And I think we have to do a better job of identifying that it's okay to feel upset. It's okay to feel depressed. Having, having faith doesn't mean that everything's perfect 24 seven. And we go through tough stuff and that's not because we're being punished. That's not because he doesn't love us. It's so that we grow and that we learn. And I think that's the thing is having faith doesn't mean your life is going to be perfect. It just means that you have something that's going to get you through those moments that are, that are tough. Um, and that struggle. And I think the more that you draw into your heart with Christ and that, you know, that he's not, he's not, a, he's not a life raft. He's a steering wheel. It, it makes it okay to get through that stuff. And you sit there and you ask sometimes why certain things happen. And especially when they happen to good people that are around you, I've dealt with more cancer than I care to count on, yeah. but you just have to, have that blind trust. And and that's where, again, like it really does parallel with this industry that this industry is blind trust. And that if you, if you're putting in the work and you're putting in the devotion and the commitment to it, it's going to work out at the end. Even if it's not the path that you thought it would take you on, it's the same thing with your life in general. We don't know what path he's already planned out for us, but we know that there is a path. And the more that you lean into that, it gets a lot easier. I have significantly less stress in my life, just being comfortable with literally feeling like I'm going down a river. I don't, I don't know if it's going to turn. I don't know if I'm going to hit rapids. I just know that I'm on, I'm on a path that's going to be okay at at the end of the day. And I think that's how I've also ended up in play by plays. I never specifically picked out play by play, you know, but I've done a little bit of everything at this point, just because opportunities have come up and I've said yes to every single one of them trusting. Yeah. Okay, here's another part to to go down. He's opened up this door and we're going to take it regardless of how we feel about it right now because he's right there with us step by step. And I think the further you cement yourself in your faith in this career, you also see a lot more people who are like minded and who are open about their faith who start to emerge as well. So you could you do feel alone from time to time. And, you know, okay, well, a lot of other people aren't really open about this or or reliant on their faith. And uh that's, that's okay. But don't, don't abandon your rock and don't abandon your reason and your calling. Um, just because you feel a little out of place about it right now, because I guarantee you at the end of the day, Christ is always going to be there. And some of those people are not, um, honestly reading Bob Goff's books have been, (laughs) I love Bob Goff. (laughs) I, I adore his, I, I can't believe it took me this long to read them, but they were such easy reads that I actually had time to squeeze them in on these bus rides in between getting work done and stuff. Even if I just had five minutes, I was like, okay, we can get through a chapter. Yeah. And I just, I wanted to pour into that just because his messages of, of love and acting out in kindness, um, really gave a, an immediate and profound impact on how to just live daily life. And I think if we live like that and we emulate that and we just pour in love to others and, and let them know that, you know, it's okay to, to talk about your faith and it's okay to talk about your path. And it's also okay to mention when you're struggling. Yes. Um, it, it just only continues to further embed that circle of people around you who are going to inspire that and to reemphasize the fact that just when it gets tough, that's when you have to lean on your faith more. That's, that's not when it's the time to walk away or think, you know, well, if he loved me, I wouldn't go through this right now. No, you're going through this because he loves you and because you can grow from these circumstances. Yeah, that's great advice there. Melanie Newman's been our guest here on the podcast. couple more questions, Melanie. So this is a hard question because I hated this question when I was uh, in the midst of my journey. Um, but I will ask it to you and let you kind of determine how you want to answer it. But five to 10 years down the road, what's Melanie Newman doing? You know, because this is a grind and this is a hard you have to really love what you're doing to stay in this world that you are in right now. And I presume that you absolutely love it, but what is five <laughs> to 10 years down the road look like for you in, in this business and life? What's that look like? My frust- my answer frustrates a lot of people because in college I wanted to be a desk anchor and that was it. I wanted to, you know, sports center and all this other stuff. And yeah. then I got the opportunity to do sidelines and I almost turned it down. And, and my dad said, you're being given an opportunity to change a, a part of a career field that you're not particularly thrilled about. If you turn it down, that's a huge loss. So I accepted it. 
and fell in love with sidelines. And then I got the play-by-play opportunity in Mobile with, well, I got it in college as well, but, um, and, and I wasn't opposed and I wasn't in favor of it either way, but it was an opportunity. So I said, okay. Um, and having just this open-mindedness and being willing to go wherever really just drastically changed my career path to the point where I don't really have that one specific niche of I have to be here or I have to be doing this or like even regardless I could be living in Alaska and you know sure so be it if that's where the job takes me then that's where it takes me um I just want to be involved I I want to be able to make a daily impact and to be able to connect an audience emotionally to athletes and to give them something of value that they walk away with at the end of the day now dream job yes would be obviously baseball is my my go-to sport that's what I've been in love with since I was a kid but I've also had such an opportunity to cover so many different sports that I never even dreamed were even possible to give coverage to. And I've had such good responses from the parents and the fans from those as well, which is really what matters at the end of the day. If these families feel like you've done justice to their children and brothers and, and husbands, that's, that's huge. Um, so just having that involvement and being able to make an impact and to add value is ultimately where I want to be at the end of the day. Yeah. I think that's a great answer too. just knowing from people who ask me advice on broadcasting. I said, just learn it all as much as you can, because you don't know the path that you're going to end up down the road. And, uh, you know, I wanted to be on air when I was in college and then I got to local radio in upstate New York and realized, Oh, I like this producer thing. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pretty good producer and did that for 20 years and, and full circle here we are now and in the broadcasting world hosting this podcast, but you just never know, try to learn as much as you can. Uh, and really that's a good, that's good advice for all jobs, not just for, uh, your broadcasting journey or my broadcasting journey. So good stuff there, Melanie. Last question for you. And this is a question we ask all of our guests here on the podcast. What are you learning from God now? What is the Lord teaching you today? Keeping an open heart. Um, I've always been, I trust people to a fault or I I give it right off the bat and I I embrace everyone right off the bat. There's really no walls to get through or or process to jump through with me. And as a kid, when you get into high school and and the dating world is not that nice, you try to change it a little bit and to put up those walls. And I've only found that it's ingrained in who I am. And I need to embrace that. And honestly, it's been the biggest payoff for me because for whatever reason, it's created a personality where I've had multiple players that I've worked with in in every sport who have said, you know, you just came in right off the bat and we immediately felt comfortable with you. We knew we could trust you and we knew that you had our best interests at heart. And I mean, I really do. I care about each of these athletes that I've worked with as if they were family. And I, I would never want to do anything that would bring pain or, you know, a misjudgment to any of them, but keeping that, that heart and that love, regardless of the pain that it might bring. And and just understanding that it's living with that Christ-like love every single day and giving that to everybody, regardless of what they look like or how they may initially treat you off the bat. That's not our decision to make. Um, it's only ours to continue to feed back into those positive vibes and, and to love on everybody. Cause it's honestly, sometimes the people who are the ugliest in behavior who need it the most. And the reality of the situation is we don't know what anybody is going through. I mean, even if that's your best friend, your mom, your significant other, you will only ever understand what you are going through to a hundred percent and, uh, giving that back and giving people a reason to smile or to feel welcomed or to feel accepted. I think especially in today's society where it's like you said earlier with social media, everything can blow up so quickly and people can really misjudge people. Um, it, It just makes it all the more crucial to, to live into that love culture and to act on it without the need of, of receiving anything in return, but to do it just because that's what we're called to do. Uh, and, and with that too, that's why I try to be transparent on social media when I'm, when I'm having a tough time or when I'm struggling, I don't ever want to be that person where someone looks at my feed and thinks, Oh, you know, <laughs> she's got the perfect life. It's all figured out. It's glitz and glamor. It is a lot of tears and a lot of stress yeah. and I would not trade it for the absolute world. But, um, having that openness and that transparency and just that love culture is, is huge. That's good stuff there. For Melanie Newman with the Salem Red Sox, one of their lead broadcasters, the lead broadcaster there, Boston's high A affiliate. 
and also working with Liberty University, football games, reporting with ESPN+. Plus. Going to do some uh, gymnastics, I believe, as well. Am I right? Or volleyball games, I'm sorry. With I was Liberty. like, not yet. <laughs> Who knows? It might be gymnastics, too. But volleyball matches on ESPN+, Plus as well. Lots of great stuff happening with Melanie. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being so open and honest. And uh, it's really nice to talk to somebody who's still on the job. Now, I'm not saying you're... You haven't made it yet, but like you're, it's as we're going here, we get to talk to you. We don't have to quite look back and say, Hey, your 25 year career was amazing. Like we're, we're talking to you in the midst and it'll be a lot of fun to watch where the Lord takes you. Thanks, Melanie. Um, Thank you. I'm excited. Great stuff there from Melanie Newman from the Salem Red Sox and ESPN plus joining us here on sports spectrums podcast. She's a lot of fun on social media. Give her a follow on Twitter at Melanie Lynn N. You can search her name, Melanie Newman. She's got the list of all the work that she's been doing on the different platforms and in the different places and spaces in the media industry that she's been involved in. But she also has Psalm 46.5 mentioned in her Twitter bio, and I'm going to read that to you. Uh, I meant to ask her this on the podcast why that scripture verse was there and important to her, but I'll read the scripture and you can interpret it this way. Psalm 46.5 reads, God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. And that's a great encouragement there, um, especially as we, you know, I think the Bible meaning for the break of dawn there isn't necessarily in the morning, but maybe a likely time for the enemy to attack. And uh, when you're caught up in a crazy um, grinding type of lifestyle that Melanie is, I'm sure she has attacks quite often from the enemy, just pulling her away from God a little bit. And it sounds like she's staying grounded uh, in her discipline and her walk with Jesus. So great stuff there from Melanie. I look forward to having her back in a couple years and seeing where the Lord has taken her on her broadcasting journey. And uh, just really appreciate her joining us here on Sports Spectrum. We also appreciate you for listening. We appreciate our sponsors, Compassion International. We told you about Compassion. We love them. Check out the website, Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum, and look for an opportunity to make a difference in a child's life, a child in poverty. You can help release them from that poverty by sponsoring them through Compassion. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum, pray about it, and consider releasing a child from poverty today. We always appreciate you listening to this podcast. We, we recently passed 1 million downloads of the Sports Spectrum podcast, and God has been just doing amazing things through this ministry, and so much of that reason is because of you listening and consuming the content that we're putting out, these stories of sports and faith. We're just trying to introduce you to people who love Jesus and love sports. That's it. It's quite simple. It's not complicated, and uh, we don't force faith on anyone, but we share these stories, and then you be the judge. Uh, But we do love you, uh, and we thank you for listening to this podcast. We hope that you'll tune in next time for a brand new episode of Sports Spectrum. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you soon.